Bonjour. I don't blame you. I'm not even that awake usually this early in the morning. So that's like, uh, uh, so today is my talk on solar flares and their impact on the SCADA systems and the dangers uh, therefore brought to me by Winch Water Tower. It's like I thought it was an important topic that we don't cover enough about solar flares. So uh, I will be discussing that. No, I'm joking. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, this is a, a talk. Uh, as you can tell by the kittens, um, it's about traveling and uh, different perspectives. And as you can tell that each of the cats have a different perspective. Um, so basically, uh, I don't want to go through a whole thing on, on what my talk is, but I want to explain how I, how I operate on my talks. One year, I'm going to give a talk on technical like hacking or social engineering or how I do stuff, you know, or break things. Then the next year, I give a rant where it's about the community or about how I feel or, you know, just something that I can just need to get off my chest. Well, last year I did a talk on spearfishing. So guess what this year is? Rant time. So, uh, so this is going to be my rant on how uh, hacking cultures are different and how they change. Um, basically, the only thing that you need to know about me is I like to travel a lot. Uh, and I don't just like to go to the conference and see the people and, and, and hear, which is a great thing, but I like to explore the city that I'm in. I like to walk around. I like to be a part of that culture stuff, you know, and actually see what goes on in the day-to-day -day thing. I don't just take the tour bus, drive around, go, oh, there are the sites. You know, it's like I spent 11 hours walking in a circle in the Zidane, uh, Zidane I'm saying it wrong, but the Zidane district in uh, uh, Beijing. It's like I went from the Coptic area of uh, Cairo all the way through uh, up the Nile to the Cairo Tower over six hours. It's like uh, walked through the streets of Barcelona for eight hours and didn't get pickpocketed, so I was very happy about that. It's like, uh, but it was just a great great time i love the experience i love seeing the people i love i love being part of that area and seeing what the place is like the same thing with the conferences i like to see the different cultures but one important thing i want to make sure that we understand i'm not speaking for anybody but me these are my perceptions and my perspectives i'm not trying to say this is how the world works for everybody so I think Russ Rogers says it the best. He says, I like tacos. That means all hackers like tacos, right? No, I like pizza, but you know, that's okay. It's like, so we all are gonna have varying degrees and differences, okay? So one of the things I wanted to start with is to get one thing out of the talk. I'm talking about cultures and the globe and about different cultures and different countries. And the first thing that we automatically go to is what? Nation states. Well, guess what? My talk isn't about nation states, but I wanted to address it right off the bat to understand exactly how skewered we are and stuff, you know, when it comes to that. Because you look at this wonderful Verizon report, and Verizon report is a good report. I'm not calling the, the, the baby ugly and stuff, you know? It's a great report. It's a good report. It's got good detail in it and stuff. You know? But look, do you notice something missing from this report? Is it really covering the whole area? It's like, you know, this was from last year. Well, this year, this year they, they had a different report, which was cool. It covered more area, but I love the way they did it. They were able to cover more area because basically what it means is that in, let's say, uh, uh, Mont Saint-Michel, there was an incident. So that means you get to cover all of France, right? Because that one little spot, it's all of France. We got, we got France covered now. So that's like one little police, uh, place in Podunk, Mississippi got attacked, all of America. That's how they do it. So they got the good cover, so that's good, so, but it still gives us good detail. There's still good numbers in there. But the thing is, you have to remember, it is not all the numbers, it's not all the details. It's a snapshot of it. It's just a, this is what we've seen. Trustwave has got a great report. I mean, come on, that's a great, their graphics department should get a bonus. That is an awesome working report. I mean, seriously, who doesn't like pie? I love pie charts. You know, it's like, cause they're cool, cause they tell us numbers and, they obviously have to be official, right? So that was, that was a great report. I love that report. Once again, maybe not quite covering everywhere, possibly, you know, just missing a couple places here and there, you know, not major, just a couple continents or two. But you know, that's great. You know, it still gives us detail. And this year, it's like, I don't know, their graphics department was really good last year and stuff, you know, but something happened, someone got a memo and they decided to jazz it up a little bit because this is this year's. Whoa, buddy. That looks like, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if I'm like reading an infor information security report or going to a rave invite, but you know, 
There you go. I do love the fact that you do see that United States is the attack source IP address. It's just the predominant one. So go, go America. Yay. Um, but, but it still gives us reports. And then it, one of the things I like, and I like reports, we need numbers, but we need to make sure that we understand those aren't all the details. That's why I like this website the most. Hackmageddon.com gives a report of, and it's got a pie chart. Remember, I love pie charts and stuff, you know, but what I love more about this pie chart, besides it being a pie chart, is it's got the flags. Because let's face it, in American stuff, you know, we don't know another country's flag until we start invading them and stuff. So this was great that we actually got to see what the, the flags are and stuff, you know, on, on, the, on the pie chart. So we got some more information and we got a, a nice lesson in, in flagmanship. So, but look at what I really like about it was the disclaimer on Hackmageddon's site. And it reads, again, no need to repeat that the data must be taken very carefully since they do refer only to the discovered attacks, the so-called tip of the iceberg, and hence do not pretend to be exhaustive, but only aim to provide a high-level overview of the global cyber uh, landscape. I love that disclaimer. I will forgive the use of cyber because that disclaimer is so good. He says he's not trying to pretend to be the exhaustive part of it. Unre unlike some reports that try to be the de facto standard, the Bible of information security, this guy is saying straight out, this is what I see. I don't see everything, but from what I see, this is what's going on. Thank you for some honesty and clarity. That's what we need. Uh, other reports are a little bit more specific. They're not trying to cover the whole globe. They're, they're trying to be more specific. They're trying to do some, paint a different picture with their data. This seems to be like, uh, this is not a scene from war games, uh, but this does seem to be like a, a directed attack based off of numbers, which is good because that's empirical data that shows something. It's like, if you go on three days later, you could probably see the reverse attack going on and that would have shown more data and stuff, you know, that would have been backed by empirical evidence, which is great. It's like, my problem is, and this is one of the things that I wanna talk about when we talk about culture and perception, is some reports seem to be a little bit more targeted. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm bringing up the, the Mandiant report. I don't know about you, but me personally, I honestly believe that at some time when Tao Security was a little child and stuff, you know, China came over and stole his lunch money. It's like, or something, I mean, I really want to look and, and talk to him and say, dude, it's like, tell me on the map uh, where, where, where China, you know, touched you because your network, because it must have been bad. It's like, because it seems so directive, so prejudiced against with the information that they, they were, most of the information we're going to have to go with saying what they're saying was empirical, but it was very slanted. And I'm, that's not just my opinion. That one, I actually did a Google search for the Mandarin report. This was the first slide, the first image that came up. So I'm not the only one thinking that maybe the Mandy report was a little bit too, you know, directed um, or, or skewered. So I thought that was good. Another thing that I just received yesterday, which this next slide shows you everything that is wrong with information security marketing. It shows you one of the major things that are wrong with our industry. This is disgusting. You're saying that the only uh, this is like some lousy company and I don't mind calling them out and stuff, you know, that's why I didn't censor anything. It's like, this is what they think is considered okay billing and okay marketing. What is wrong with us on that? That is irritating because of the fact that they think that what is their engine? They're saying basically what their forensic engine is basically something that detects Chinese characters and they go, oh, APT. Seriously? It's like, that's the only kind of threats that are coming through. That is a lousy company. That is a lousy technology. I don't need it if that's what they think the threat is. They obviously don't know what they're doing and they don't know what our, our, our threats really are out there. If they're gonna be that focused and that determined. But let's go and say for a moment and stuff, you know, we're gonna go after and what these guys say and start it right off. Let's start off getting this nation state out of the way. The Chinese are bad because of all these things, right? They spy on their citizens, they spy on their countries, they infect other nations with malware, they try to censor the press, they try to suppress the protesters. Let's, let's review that, shall we? Let's review. The first one, what do they do? They spy on their citizens. Let's talk about that for a second, because that's not cool, right? Oh, wait. 
Oh, wrong slide. I guess that's us, right? Oops, my bad. I love the fact that one right here, NSA admits employees spied on husbands, boyfriends, and girlfriends. So basically the response is we need to get spies to spy on the other spies that are spying on people they shouldn't be spying on, even though we're spying on everyone. How does that work? Right? It's like, and I love the fact that they get to do all that spying and stuff, you know, because it's like, because that shows that they're doing their job, right? Well, what was that second bullet? Something about them spying on other countries? Oh, that's not good. And I love the fact that it's like they, they, they say U.S. scurries to shore up spying on Russia because of the fact that they didn't even understand what was going on in Russia. They're too busy spying on their boyfriends and girlfriends to figure that out. Uh, another thing is, look, look at Merkel. Look how sad she is. Do you know how sad it is to make a German that sad? That's bad. That lady wasn't that sad since George W. Bush groped her, okay? It's like, that is a horrible thing to do. It's like, I feel bad for them. And then look right here. Italian magazine says the U.S. Spy, uh, US spies listen to the Pope. The Vatican says they run aware. Come on, people. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care if you're an atheist. I don't care what your beliefs are. You have to admit We've got a pretty good pope right now, okay? That's a good pope. I like this pope. He is a good guy. I mean, spying on that other guy with the red shoes, maybe. He, was, he seemed a little sketchy to me, okay? But this is a good pope. We like this pope. Why are you be spying on him? It's like, you know, that's just not cool. So, uh, so there you go. It's like, so we, we knocked those two down. What was the next one? Well, that wasn't it. There we go. So uh, they infect other nation computers with malware. That's a horrible thing to do. Oops. Um, you know, one of the things I love about the Stuxnet part of it is, it's like, that's the great part, is America was like, when, when they were doing it and stuff, you know, usually when you get called out and stuff, there's all this denial. So it's like, oh, how dare you accuse us of that kind of activity? America was like, how dare you accuse us of that activity? <laughs> that, is, that is a horrible that you would accuse us of such great workmanship to accuse of a, such a highly targeted and sophisticated and advanced, beautifully executed program. That is just ludicrous and beyond. Thank you very much, we enjoy our work. But yes, that is horrible. How dare you? You know, so, so you get there and you're just like, so what was, the, what was that, I know there's like three, so we're, we're almost there. Four, they try to censor the press, that's a horrible thing. Luckily we've got our first amendment, right? It's like, you know, the freedom of the press. That's a good thing to have. Usually, sometimes, it's like if you can get away with it. So there we go. That's, an, that's another problem that we're having to face. This is the one uh, I really have an issue with right here. They try to suppress protesters. That's not cool, right? Oh, crap. I love this one right here. The picture in the far right is beautiful. That is what George W. Bush called a free speech zone. That is some Orwellian stuff right there, you know. If you can't tell what the free speech zone is, it's right there by the machine guns and the steel barricade. It's like you may not have noticed it, but it's right there. That's your free speech zone. It's like, and the other one here is, I love this one, the new evidence that the U.S. Army hired spies to go undercover among the local anti-war protesters. What they don't say is who those protesters were. They were the Quakers. That's almost as bad as going after the Pope. You're going after the Quakers? I mean, seriously, in that little living room coffee clutch and stuff, you know, with everybody sipping coffee, that's a disturbance you have to be worried about. So it's just, it's just really sad. But yeah, so, so what we've done, hopefully, and what I wanted to show beyond a shadow of a doubt is we're all doing it. Every country is, look at this map showing uh, command and control areas. Do you see it in one local country only? Are you being attacked by one country? No, you're even being attacked by Canada. Canada! I mean, I can just imagine that hacker over there right now going like, excuse me, I'm going to have to pwn your machine, I'm sorry. <laughs> you say, if you don't terribly mind and stuff, you know I'm going to destroy your infrastructure. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, come on, even Canada's getting in on the action. Everybody's doing it, people. This isn't a one country issue. This isn't a one nation problem. So basically, this is the way it goes. It's like, this is a good common saying in America. It's like, if your friends would jump off the bridge, would you? Well, yes, because it seems like the thing to do at the time.
So we're all doing it. So no more nation states. I'm not talking, when I t finish the rest of this talk, it is about what matters. It is about hacking culture, it is about hackers, it is about the actual art of hacking. Forget the government part of it. Forget what that is. We're talking about what matters and that's about being us. So let's start this trip around the world in 80 days. That's where I got the title. Because I wanted to start talking about how different cultures are. So what I've done basically is I'm going to share a story from a different region and then I'm going to have someone from that region answer some questions about it through a survey that I gave out. So my first uh, uh, round up there is going to China. It's like 2008 was the first time I got my passport. I got it in September 2008. November 2008, I went on my first trip to Beijing because if you're going to go big, go big. You know, it's like so I went to XCon, a wonderful conference there. It's like it was a great conference, a very formal conference. I was, I, I'm used to like, you know, the rowdy like DEF CON, woohoo, you know, crazy. Everybody was very orderly. It's like uh, they had like uh, teacups and it was like, it was really cool. It was very orderly and stuff, you know, but it was very nice. There was people that were sharing information, they were talking. I had a conversation with a guy from uh, the Shanghai uh, police force and he was talking to me about some of the challenges that he faced dealing with cybercrime within China. There is an issue of cybercrime going on within China. It's like they have limits and they have responsibilities that they have to go through. It's like, and it's like, and you see that going on. And, and I'm talking to this guy, and I mean, seriously, halfway through the conversation, I wanted to go, bring it in here, buddy. I'll give you a hug. I know it's bad. It, it, it's just this way in America. We're having the same problems. Don't worry. We're, I noticed on that moment, on that trip, I realized how closed minded or how changed by the way that the media shows how the rest of the world is that I was so in the dark about. And so that became my mission to start understanding the cultures, stop listening to what I was told and raised on, and started trying to go with a fresh perspective and see the country from the people that are actually there and get that other side of the story, because obviously I wasn't getting it uh, up until then. So uh, that was my, one of my first experiences. As, but let's talk to someone that's uh, from that area. He says, well, what country uh, are you familiar with? This guy's from India. He says, how did you find out about hacking? He said, the Matrix movie. Cool people hacked into the Matrix and did cool kung fu. Uh, you know, the other word. Uh, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Negative. Is hacking in your region seen as more for crime, hacktivist, nation state, or other? And just simply crime. That's how they see hacking in that region. Crime. Wasn't happy about that answer, but that's his answer. That's what his perce perception was. That's not my perception. That's not what I want my perception to be, but I have to go with what the survey says. So let's talk about, look, representing, that's me and Miko at Hack in Paris a couple years ago. So let's start off about Europe. It's like one of my first experiences at a con here was uh, actually Nuit de Hack. I'll talk about my, uh, my first uh, Nuit de Hack four years ago. Unbelievable. And I'm not saying this because I'm at a place where there's some people from the hack here. It's like, I'm saying it because it's true. It's like, it is a, an encapsulated, concentrated, adrenaline field, just one, I mean, this was like going to DEF CON for three days, you do it in one night. It was awesome. There were workshops, there were the CTF area, there were people meeting and talking and learning. That is what it's about. And that's what I was overwhelmed with in the friendliness and the acceptance and stuff, you know, from a guy who doesn't, I tell people and stuff, you know, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm from America, so I only speak English and I'm from Texas, so I don't speak it very well. And it's like, but people were willing to come up and talk to me. People were willing up to, to, to share information with me. It was awesome. I had a great time there. And so that was one of my first experiences in Europe was uh, that conference. So let's talk to, uh, uh, the, let's go back to the, the survey again. What country are you more familiar with? Belgium. How did you find out about hacking? Was connected to the BBS and Fidonet. Fidonet. It's like, that's old school. So this guy's been in around for a while. Um, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? The term hacker is immediately linked to bad guy due to the bad uses of the word uh, the, uh, and the press. Go figure. Is hacking in your region seen as more for crime, hacktivist, nation, state, or other? Crime, first and foremost. Two, hacktivists, there was anonymous campaigns against well-known companies that was massively re re relayed by the press. Once again, the press helping shape the story. 
Hacklers are bad and they're bad guys. So let's go to the next one. Let's go to South America. My, uh, my only experience was I, I went to Brazil for a conference there. And one of the funniest parts of the whole conversation was I was at the speaker dinner and one of the Brazilian hackers there was actually talking about the fact that he didn't have any proper street cred. He was like, yeah, I'm not even seeing like, hackers aren't even seen as cool here and stuff, you know, because hacking's not illegal. So we're not seen like as like the cool guys or anything. We're just seen as a bunch of dweebs and nerds because it's like, we're not committing a crime. And I'm like, I'm sorry, maybe you'll get arrested one day. I, I, I don't, what am I supposed to say to this? It's like, but the good news is, is they recently have passed laws against hacking now, so he should be happy, right? It's like, so I, I don't really know how to address that situation. But once again, it was a different culture than mine. I just accept it, okay? So let's talk to uh, someone from Brazil. And he says, how did you find out about hacking? And I love this answer, trying to get things done, because what exemplifies a hacker more than that statement right there? trying to get things done. It says, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Nowadays, it's a mix of good and bad. People sort of understand it. Back in the day, early 90s, the internet wasn't quite widespread. Uh, BBSs, uh, stolen credentials to universities were the way to go. At that point in time, unless you were doing something, you wouldn't really be aware of hacking. With online banking being implemented in 96 and 97, bankers' activity started increasing quickly in Brazil. Bankers' activity means you know credit card fraud and stealing from the banks and stuff. So. Uh, is hacking in your region seen as more for crime activists, nation state or other, considering those that don't know anything about it and just see stuff in the news, mostly tied to crime and sometimes hacktivism in the corporate world, a better understanding to ethical hacking. Do we see a trend here forming? I did. My talk started changing. It's like my, my attitude started changing. So let's go to, to Africa. It's like, I sort of cheat on this one, okay? Because the only place I've been to Africa technically was Egypt, and I'm being told from other people, like, well, that's more in the Middle East, Jason. It's like, hey, geographically, it's Africa, so I've been there. Okay, it counts, okay? I'm knocking that one off. And one of the things I liked about, uh, this is me in Cairo. The, the, I feel so bad for the Egyptians. I really didn't mean to be this way, but it's like, they put me in a suit. So all the attendees had the false impression that I was mature in like a business-like person, okay? As you can tell from these pictures, I totally disabused them of that notion quickly. It's like uh, one of my favorites is because in, in Egypt, the conference was like, it was a straight up hacking conference, but everybody was like, this was a business function. This was like, this was where you exchange business cards and you talk about, yes, I create that, uh, program and stuff, you know, with the zero day that I implemented and stuff, you know, and it was uh, very, uh, very, very well done. And I'm like, well, this is way too formal for me. My, one of my favorite moments, though, I have to be honest, one of my favorite moments was a, one of the students here uh, in the picture. It's like uh, he'd never been to a hacking conference before, so he thought it was like awesome. So he takes that picture. You know the picture because I've done this picture. You know the picture in front of the banner of the, you know, the, the I'm here at the conference, you know. He, did, he took that picture like that, not realizing 20 feet behind him, I was in the frame going like this in my suit. <laughs> awesome photo bomb. I love that picture. So, but that was, that was my experience uh, to, um, uh, to Egypt and stuff, you know, and, and the continent of Africa. But let's talk to someone that's actually a little bit more, you know, resident there. Uh, he's from South Africa. It's like, how did you find out about hacking when trying to call UK long distance numbers from South Africa during apartheid? So he found a problem. He looked for a solution. <laughs> it's like, and he found it. True hacker mentality. In your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? There is still a stigma attached to hacking, as in hacking into network apps or overbuilding. It's seen as more criminal than anything. Is hacking in your region seen for more as crime, hacktivist, nation state, or other? The media have dictated the view of hackers in most countries, so it's hard to put a positive slant on it. Also, criminals and genuine hackers are put in the same category. Really? Let's move on. So let's talk about the Middle East. It's like uh, one of my uh, very experiences from the Middle East is like uh, when I went to uh, Beirut, Lebanon. It's like I was at a, a conference there, and uh, or I was meeting some friends there, and one of the guys 
I met there was this new hacker. He's up and coming and stuff, you know, and he wanted to show me something on his laptop. I was like, oh, show me what kind of work you're working on and stuff, you know, and the work he was working on was he had full access to the nation's telecom system on his laptop. I'm like, cool. And he's like, yeah, that's like, I've got, I've, I've had it for like four years. I'm like, what are you doing with it? It's like, what have you done? It's like, he's not messed with his bill. He pays his bill regularly. He's not eavesdropping on other people's conversations or trying to do geo He just has access. Because why not? So I was like, cool. It's like, it is literally the wild, wild west out there. It's like when it comes to hacking, because there's so many, the technology and stuff, you know, and the actual computer network intrusions and the, and the security and stuff, you know, is not really out there right now. They're so based on physical security and worried about that, they don't understand they also have to protect their networks as well, okay? I'm not gonna talk about how many nation states and stuff, you know, have Cisco, Cisco for their routers that are at their edge of their countries, okay? There's a lot, and it's not just the Middle East. It's like, it, it's just one of those things. So let's talk to someone from the Middle East. See, this is where I cheated, because I cheat, because I don't mind. It's like, uh, it's like, now I'm gonna go and say that Egypt is in the Middle East, because this was a good uh, response. He says, what, what country are you more familiar with? Egypt. He says, how did you find out about hacking? I love this one. Called a virus in 2005 because a certain person downloaded pirated games and it was backdoored. I wonder who that was. Uh, wondered how those virus worms worked. Learned some programming, first by viewing sample viruses, sources, and walked that road and never went back. Take that in for a second. It's like he was compromised. Instead of just being the victim, just instead of being the person that was like, oh, I've, I've been attacked, he was like, hmm, I wonder how that works. Let, let's, let's reverse that and see what happened. Let's see what goes on. That's the hacker mentality. It's like, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Hacking is generally viewed as hacking people's Facebook and Yahoo accounts. How sad is that? They're still using Yahoo. Makes you want to cry. Okay, sorry. Uh, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Oh, I already did that one. Okay, is hacking in your region seen as more for crime, hacktivist, nation state, or other? Most viewed as a crime, few know about hacktivism. And that's after Tahrir Square. Only few know about hacktivism. So let's talk about North uh, America. It's like, um, I want to, uh, one of the conversations I want to talk about when we talk about and what my talk is about is about community. It is about people getting involved and stuff, you know, and about hackers and what hacker, to be a hacker really means. I have to talk about DerbyCon, and not just because the guy who created it has actually showed up, so. Uh, <laughs> so I go there and it's like, you go to DerbyCon and the one thing that you know about it, right off the bat, is that everybody is on the same plane. Everybody's on the same field. It's like. You have H.G. Moore sitting in the lobby and stuff working on, I learned a new trick on a hard disk encryption from him, which was awesome. He was just sitting in the lobby, just working on his laptop, working on his presentation. Egypt from Metasploit 7 and Rabbit 7 was like playing chess for anybody that showed up. All, all matters of the night and stuff, you know, and I think the more uh, drunk he got, the better he played at chess. I don't know how that works, okay, but it works for him. So it's like good on him. It's like bad on everybody that tried to challenge him. It's like but there was a sense of community. There were no egos. There was no, oh, that's that person. It was, hey, there's that person. Let's come over and talk. That's the way it should be everywhere. We are all here to learn from one another. I have learned stuff from this, uh, from this conference and stuff, you know, and I hope that you learned something from me. It is not a one-way street. It is for both of us, all of us together, to start talking and meeting everybody. And that is part of your responsibility as being a hacker. It's like to get to know and connect with other people. Everybody in this room has the same passion. They have an interest in what we're doing or they wouldn't be here. Unless they want to go to Euro Disney and this is the way they talk to family and doing it. I don't know. But most of everybody in here, that should be their main goal. That should be their reason. So let's talk about the survey. 
What country are you more familiar with? The USA. How did you find out about uh, hacking? First movies then properly through an instructor, uh, instructor and vocational program in high school, which I thought was really cool. I love the movies part. It's like, let's face it, Angelina Jolie in the movie Hackers got more people into hacking than any uh, manual or book out there, okay? Let's, that's just the way it works. Uh, in your region, how is hacking seen by the general public? Negative. Is hacking your region seen as more for crime, hacktivists, nation, state, or other? Crime. People seem to feel that anyone who makes something behave outside of how it was designed are automatically committing a crime. These same people during the 40s and 60s spent a good amount of their time working and building hot rods modifying cars. This is really the point where I get pissed off because my talk was not about this. My talk was supposed to be about how our cultures were different, how the Malaysian hackers were more into hacker spaces, the German hackers were more about privacy rights, how uh, there was more reverse engineering and stuff, you know, in one region versus the other. This was not a talk about how we're criminals. This was not supposed to be a talk about one of the biggest unifying things that we have in our uh, community is that we're seen as something bad. That offends me. This is our history lesson, people. These are hackers. This is where we came from. Alan Turing, the master of encryption, saved thousands of lives during World War II decrypting the Enigma machine. He was a hero until his social lifestyle wasn't fitting to the public norm and stuff, you know, and he was castrated and committed suicide by the public that he saved. What about Nikolai Tesla, the father of open source? The reason why we are denied a lot of his inventions is because he didn't want to make money on it, so people didn't want to invest in it. He died alone in his hotel room, took the make two days to figure out he was dead. The greatest love in his life was a pigeon that he saved in New York, Central Park. That was his reward. Paul Gutlet, Belgium. Sorry guys, Al Gore didn't invent the internet. He did in 1934, creating the, the foundation of what the internet was supposed to be and what it was like. A major, massive peace activist that wanted nothing but to make the world better. We still use his indexing system. Died destitute in 1944 because no one really believed in that dream. Ada Lovelace. Let me give my only comment I'm going to make on the uh, women in tech industry, okay? She's the first computer programmer. She started the computer programming movement until she was, you know, even after that, she was ostracized by her family because of her social beliefs and stuff, you know, and she died and stuff from her treatment of cancer instead of the actual cancer itself. But that is who started it. Women have not been allowed into tech, people. Women let men into tech. They started it. This is their industry that I got to be a part of. What about a, another one, one of my famous Uber hackers, Leonardo da Vinci. He was like the, the consummate goal of what a hacker should be. But he died really well, loved by everybody around him and stuff, you know, and the prince gave him a palace to, to retire in, so it didn't fit my narrative and I'm trying to manipulate your emotions. But, uh, but yeah, so, so we won't talk about him, okay? Um, so here we go. That's where we started though from. Those are hackers, inventors, artists, creators. They saw the world differently saying, this is the way people tell me it's supposed to be. Let me do it some way else. So where do we go? We go to this. We're now the villain in this story. And if you don't think we're the villain, look at this. Jerry Hammond, tenure, and I'm not going to debate, and I'm not trying to comment or make a commentary on if they were guilty or innocent or not, not part of this conversation. The thing is the sentencing. Jerry Hammond, 10 years for hacking. 
Weave got 10 years for hacking. It was overturned, finally. All he did was browse the directory. Let's face it, when you're in the 90s and searching places maybe you shouldn't search and you want to go through the picture folders, you did the same thing. So we could all be criminals at one time or another by browsing the directory structure in an URL. Max Ray Butler, 13 years for hacking. Roman Vega, 18 years for hacking. Albert Gonzalez deserved 20 years for hacking. That was their crime. Was it, was it reasonable? Should it have been? I don't know. But I will give you maybe a counterpoint, maybe a different perspective. Malik Richmond, one year for rape. Gerhard Becker, one year for involuntary manslaughter of a firefighter. Trent Mays, two years for rape. Seth Hornberger, three to six years for voluntary manslaughter. It was pleaded down for murder. Jessica Ferracio, five years for murder of a 23-month-old toddler that she was babysitting, crashed his head in. That's a crime. She's probably already out by the time this talk has been given. Those hackers, most of them still in prison. Where is the justice in that? And the problem is us as well. One of the things that I hate about the way that we talk about hacking and it talks about judicials is that we like to be that mysterious hacker figure. Guess what, people? What humans don't understand, they fear. What they fear, they try to destroy. So you get a jury of your peers who don't even know how to turn on their computer or respond to AOL properly, and those are the people that are going to be giving you sentences for things that you've done. So let's talk about some other criminals. Here's Bill Gates. 1970, uh, in the 1970s when he was in school, uh, they, got, uh, they borrowed computer time in their high school. They actually stole the administrator password. They won't say how they did it, but it's a fact that they stole the administrator password. They had access into the uh, third-party company's system to get more computer time. How many years in jail did they get? They got their computer time revoked at school. And they created Windows. I don't know which is the greater offense, but you know. Uh, there you go. So that's what they did. Okay, well, let's talk about another criminal. It's like, what about these two guys? These two guys, Steve Jobs and Wozniak, sold blue boxes, illegal telephone devices to circumvent the system, to make free phone calls, to defraud a business, a reputable business company trying to make a living. Wozniak was even funny about it that he put a warranty inside the box because he thought that was funny. Offering a guarantee on an illegal, illegal product, which he self-admitted, in such a quirky uh, way appealed to Wozniak's sense of humor. It's kind of strange in itself. It's kind of unusual, but I felt it was worth the joke. Not the prison time, but the joke. It's like between 1973 and 75, several of the Oath Toe Bars and Berkeley Blues customers, that's their hacker handles because they're, they're cool, um, were the boxes wound up at the FBI laboratory where they were dis disassembled and analyzed because they were criminal devices. But they got like severe sentences. No, I'm joking. They got iPhones. But, you know, um, that's what happens. That's how we rewarded those criminals back in the day. What about 2010? Another young man who had already founded a multi-million dollar company broke into a utility closet at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He hooked up a laptop to the campus network and downloaded 4 million academic journal articles, most of them in the public domain, from a paid archive to which he had a subscription. He was arrested, indicted twice on multiple counts of fraud, and at a trial that was to be begun in April, could have faced 50 years in federal prison and a $1 million fine. His name was Aaron Schwartz. He was hounded to death by a government and stuff, you know, that he was trying to do something on a paid subscription. 40 years ago, guy breaks into a network and steals the credentials, gets to found a million dollar company. Nowadays, million dollar guy who owns a company gets hounded to death for prosecution over a crime like that. What went wrong? 
I can understand in a change in a hundred years from being artists and creatives and hackers. But 40 years ago, it wasn't like this. This changed. The media's perception of how we are, that we've helped fuel. Look at this picture. This isn't a hacker. This is the Nazgul. I mean, I'm, I'm seriously, I, every time I see this picture, I get the instinct to throw a ring at it. I mean, it's crazy. This is what they're saying hackers are. My computer room is cold. I have never hacked with a hoodie fully up and the ski mask on. It's never that cold. Why are these media getting these kind of representations of us and why are they spreading this image? Well, we help a little bit, you know. These are actual hackers. It's like, uh, I think they're Mossad, so I'm not gonna make too much fun of them. Uh, but it's like, this is actually, you know, they're volunteering for this picture. And then this is how the media represents the good guys. Welcome to Cyber U. Raytheon joins with colleges to train the next generation of net ninjas. So if you're a hacker, you're Nazgul. If you're a geek at a keyboard stuff, you know, doing the good stuff, you're a ninja. <laughs> I am personally offended at that image because I'm a ninja, okay? That's not the way we go, okay? We don't work out like that. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going too much of a rant. What about this story? Glenn Beck criticizes Watch Dogs, the video game, from promoting hacking. What the heck is wrong with us? Okay, what the heck is wrong with him, first of all? Have you ever seen some of his shows? If not, don't try, okay? Please, don't Google that one, okay? This guy is just, being on the wrong side of Glenn Beck is being on the right side of history, okay? Um, but yeah, so it's like, but that's not the best response. The best response I saw this morning from Bravo Hacks, he says, I hear Watchdog teaches you how to hack, going to expense for educational training purposes and submit for CISSP creds. That is awesome, because you know what? I think about trying that. <laughs> that might actually work. So that's a good response. A better response was what happened here. Uh, last year at DerbyCon, uh, there was this guy, uh, Sterling Riggs Jerkoff, uh, from this uh, TV station. That's the nicest way that I can talk about him, by the way, so I'm sorry. But uh, he wrote this thing on his Facebook page about the DerbyCon hacking conference. And I'm gonna try to talk in his voice. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this DerbyCon happening at the Hyatt downtown. It's a convention for computer hackers. Sessions include password cracking, hacker war games, and a lock picking uh, pavilion. Thoughts? I mean, listen to that. And then you've got the responses, which I mean, let's, let's go, let's just show you how, how we can really get going in there. Greg Troutman. The LMPD and FBI should break the convention and arrest the people who are doing the training. <laughs> FBI was already in attendance. Uh, Michelle Perry Richardson, scary. Poor Darcy, she was so scary she could only do an emoticon. She couldn't even type. Connie uh, Grasshauer, I bet no arrest. More like empl employment opportunities. Very well, actually. It's like Jimmy Smith. Wow, that's insane. Really? The threat is. Uh, Sean Goodman, what about classes on mugging car theft? Isn't he the witty one? Brenda Newton was like, Sean, that's next week, lol, she's so funny. And then you've got Amber going, I think it's stupid. Amber, you didn't capitalize I, I think you're stupid. And then Jen Jen goes, arrest them all. Seriously, people. I should have seen the targeted ads on this Facebook page. The targeted ads were for pitchforks and fire. That was the response. That was what they saw. Without any information, Iron Geek, uh, Adrian Crenshaw saw this post on Facebook, tweeted it out to the world, saying, hey guys, who wants to respond to this these, these mass hysteria that's being created on this Facebook page? A lot of hackers did. <laughs> we started posting. Did we flame them? Did we put little just LOL pics on them? Did we do the troll face? No, we gave them information. We educated them. This was an opportunity to educate the public and make them aware of what we really were about. There was a reasoned response. People were being shown, this is what we are. This is who we are. We are human. We are trying to learn. We're trying to make the place better. I mean, we're hackers. There's still some trolling, okay? But still, overall, it was an educational opportunity. So Sterling Riggs Jerkoff did the only thing that he possibly could do. 
in response to that kind of overwhelming support and authoritative information on the subject. He deleted the Facebook post. It no longer fit his narrative of what hackers were, so he had to get rid of it. I know you tell me the time, but I'm gonna ignore you, I'm sorry. It's like, so let's go. Are we the only ones responsible for that? Or is it just the media? Are we just gonna blame the media, those hypocrites? Guess what? I'm a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite because I loved making fun of McDonald's uh, coffee lady. Does everybody know, does everybody know the coffee lady, please? I don't know if it's just an American thing. Well, back in the day, uh, the reason why you have to have coffee is hot on the cup is because of this lady, supposedly. And urban legend is that she spilled her coffee while driving and stuff, you know, and she sued McDonald's for $2.9 million because her coffee was hot. Boo-hoo, our coffee's hot. She was turned into a joke in the national press about how she spilled her coffee on herself and it was too hot. And the press ran with that story. They made that story of a money saver. So, you know, it's like it was just, it was all over the place, all over the news. It was in the talk shows. Uh, Jay Leno, you know, Johnny Carson, whoever it was at the time, was like saying the jokes about it. It was hilarious. If you didn't know the facts, like the fact that she burned 15% of her body that needed skin grafts, that McDonald's served the coffee at 180 to 190 degrees Fahrenheit to keep it hot during the transport. The fact that all those people highlighted in pink were admitted to emergency rooms because of scalding on coffee. Then it didn't become so funny. Then it didn't become that message that we hear in the media. Guess what, people? Let me put it simply. I've met the McDonald's uh, hot coffee lady, and she is us. We are letting the media show what they want to show about us and not fighting back with it. We're letting them tell us the narrative. We're letting them turn us into that image that we want them to say, that we're just an Nazgul with ski masks and stuff on a computer keyboard. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way at all. Once we accept our limits, we can go beyond them. And it's not like we don't have people showing us. It's not like we don't have people directing us the right way. This is the great time where I get to embarrass people because this is some of the people that are actually leading that, that are trying to change the narrative, that are trying to take back the word hacker and make it something good again. It's like, y'all may uh, know Dave Kennedy. He was on Fox News. It's like, uh, you also may have seen him on MSNBC and Fox News. Uh, you also may have seen him on CNN and Fox News. Uh, he's also been on Bloomberg and Fox News. And I think one time he was on the Katie Couric show uh, before he went on to Fox News again. It's like every time I see him in real life, I'm amazed that there's not a whole Chiron going behind him and stuff and giving me stock quotes. And stuff, you know, I still expect that to see that. Uh, but look at all these other guys that are going at Dan Kaminsky, Wunsi, Evan Booth. They are out there giving that image. They're saying we're hackers. We're trying to educate you. We're here to protect you. We're from the internet. We're here to help. You know, it's like that's the kind of message that we should be giving. And the other question I have is, why is it just this small group of people? Why not you? My bio says I'm the Times Person of the Year for the world uh, for the year uh, for 2006. Guess what? So are you. Why aren't you talking to your local press, your local newspaper, your local television show when a, news, uh, when a news breaks about some kind of security thing, giving them the actual proper information? Not for fame, but for education. Start being a voice in your community about what hacking is, because if you don't become a voice, you're going to lose it. If you don't start showing them what a true hacker is, they're going to go with who got the, the biggest image, who's got the biggest representation. And right now, that's the media. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We are from hackers. We are from creators. We are artists. We are not this guy. Because if you do not stand up and start telling people what hacking is, what security is, you have people like this doing it. And I just don't like the guy very much, personally, so. 
What can we do about it? Do you understand what hacking is? What the culture of hacking is? It's trying to make things better. You do not start hacking by going and saying, well, this goes to this. I wonder if I can make it worse. No. I wonder if I can make it do something differently. Sometimes that does make it worse and you go, oh, I learned something new. Awesome. I better help someone fix that so they don't make it worse and then everybody's doing it worse. But what else do we do? We try to change the stuff around us, not just the computers. This is blood code. It's a blood drive at DEF CON. Started three years ago because uh, one of our hackers in our community was very sick. So what did hackers do when that happened? They tried to find a solution. They had a blood drive. The first blood code happened one day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at DEF CON. The lady from the Blood Institute, the, the blood donation place, was in tears halfway through because they reserved all the spots for blood donors before 9 a.m. and she had to spend the rest of the day telling people she didn't have room for them. That many people tried to come out. The second year of blood code was the largest blood drive in Nevada state history. Also, the Ninja Networks was giving out party passes, so that might have helped. But it's like, but the third blood code, which was last year, no sweepstakes, no giveaways, nothing. It was donate because it's the right thing to do. Second largest blood drive in Nevada State history. Because that's how hackers do. They see something wrong, they want to fix it. What about Johnny Long? Got Johnny Long, he's a missionary in Uganda. He sees a problem, he went out there to try to fix it. He started out working, he's like, he's trying to start off, you know, being the great hacker that he was. It's like, he's trying to start off, I'm gonna fix everything. It's like, and then he realized, okay, maybe I'm gonna add support and help do technical support for everybody else and, and help provide even more coverage. That's what he does. And it's great, because it's like, he's got the shirt, Hackers for Charities. I love the front of the shirt, because it says, I hack charities, and I get people like, how dare you? How dare you? you hack charities? No, 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 no. I hack charities. It's a charity. I'm not a bad guy. It's like I'm not advertising that I commit a crime and stuff, you know, and I hack, you know, poor defenseless, you know, nonprofits. Um, and what about this guy right here? This is China Eagle. It's like he's the Johnny Long of China. It's like he goes and puts out computer systems and school networks and stuff in the western parts of China. He's a patriot. He, he hates cybercrime. He wants more people to be more patriotic and turn away from that kind of stuff. The problem in America and stuff, you know, you see is, is that it's like, it's okay to be a patriot. They don't seem to realize that other countries have patriots too. <laughs> so it's like, that, that's, one the, one, that's one of their problems they don't understand. It's like, these people are great. These are humanitarians first. It's like, and we're people first. It's like, we should be hackers first. And then the whole country thing is not, it's not based, my country does not resolve on the geographical location I'm at. My family and my environment and stuff, you know, and my community is global because I'm connected by the internet to all of them. And that's the way I see the world. That's not the way I see my country. That's not the way I see my city. That's the way I see the world because that's where I'm from now. And we have to do it quick, people, because hackers are breeding. Think about that for a second. It's okay to be the Nazgul. It's okay to be the scary hacker. Until you start realizing that's what you're leaving your children. That's the world you're gonna leave your children, that they're criminals, that they're hacking, what you're doing is something illegal, something mysterious, something bad? No. They need to understand that what hacking is, unleashing the creativity, unleashing the, the ability to, to solve problems and create solutions. One of the best moments I've ever had in my life was walking down an elementary school with my daughter hand in hand. One of her schoolmates walks by and she looks at her schoolmate, looks up to me and goes, that's my daddy, he's a hacker. <laughs> you damn right. <laughs> the pride in that voice, I mean, it got me. She was proud of her daddy because he was a hacker. I used to tell her that I was a ninja and she got in trouble at school for that one, but, but I'm still a hacker for sure, okay? That's still good. 
And I'm proud of that. And my children are proud of that. And they want to be creative. They want to be inventive. They want to be a hacker. Maybe not for their whole career, but they want to be a hacker. My, my son's 14, he wants to be a video game designer, of course, because that's what you're supposed to do, watch YouTube videos and be a video game designer. But still, he wants to be a hacker. He wants to develop. He wants to create. And one thing that we need to let people understand, we're not special. You're not a special snowflake sitting in that chair. You're human. Hacking is not something that we just mysteriously have. It's who we are. These children in Ethiopia were given a box unopened of Android tablets within five months of not even knowing the English language. They had hacked the systems, bypassed the security functions to activate the cameras and other restrictions on the machines. Zero instruction. Not even knowing the English language, they learned it, they taught it themselves, and then they learned how to hack it because they wanted other features, they wanted other things, they figured out a way to do it. This five-year-old kid hacked into his Xbox account because his uh, dad wouldn't let him into the game. That was the motivation. He found a flaw that Microsoft rewarded him for because it was an actual security flaw. That's a hacker. This girl's grandfather couldn't hold a cup because of Parkinson's disease. What did she do? She designed a cup that he could hold that is being marketed now and is going to be on the service that's going to benefit thousands of other people that suffer the same disease. Hacking is who we are. It's part of being human. It's in your DNA. It is not a mysterious art that you acquire when you're, when you're given a hoodie once you've completed the trials. It is who we are. And other humans need to know that. So go out there and go forth and be that message. Because we are a community. And the best way to sum it up, I think, is through Kevin Bacon. Because we're all two degrees, due to the power of my awkward hugs, we're two degrees away from Bacon, uh, Kevin Bacon. We're all connected. We are all able to talk to the person next to us. We all have something in common. Start being a community. Stop just being an industry. Stop just being an echo chamber. Stop being high school. Start being a community and start learning and showing other people out there that aren't in the community. Show them what it is and show them why they should be a part of us. Because we should be accepting everybody. Not just the ones that are the cool ones. Not just the ones that have the hoodies. The ones that still have problems with their AOL disc. They should be part of this. Rant over. <laughs> Any questions? Solar I already talked about solar first. You missed it. Yes? Yay! We're done and I'm over and I'm probably upset the organizers, but we're good. All right, thank you guys.